So, good morning, everybody. Today we're going to cover, uh, as part of our coverage of intellectual property and patents and copyrights and trademarks, uh, infringement. But before I do, I wanted to pass out for the benefit of everybody here who was attending the lecture on um, prototyping um, an invention for a provisional patent application. I want to uh, pass out the uh, prototypes that Professor Slocum used in his provisional patent application uh, for, I think you'll recall the name of the invention was run fins. And as these prototypes demonstrate, first of all, they're a far cry from the um, uh, final fully developed product that was patented ultimately with a non-provisional. Uh, but this kind of is, gives a good example of uh, the, rough, the rough sketch, the rough idea that um, uh, inventors will use when filing a provisional application. Um, so. Um, let me pass them out so you can actually, they, these things actually do exist. There's, there's a reality behind all of this stuff that we talk about here. And I think it's helpful sometimes to see the actual product. I certainly learn more by modeling or copying or imitating. Um, at least for me, uh, you can say a picture is worth a thousand words, but uh, really the invention that accompanied a provisional application is worth even more. You get to actually see the product before it's really been refined or fully developed. Um, this is the, what I guess you would call the demonstrator technology. And, and, and it emphasizes once again that it doesn't have to be perfect when you file the provisional application. Uh, time uh, permits the inventor from the date of filing the provisional to come up with a final design. Um, Anyhow, let's talk a little bit about um, infringement. We've talked about uh, creating an intellectual property right, whether it be a patent or a trademark or a copyright uh, or um, uh, a trade secret. But what happens when those, uh, those rights are violated? Um, infringement, simply defined, uh, is any breach of an intellectual property right. And intellectual property rights are infringed when a protected work is used, copied, or otherwise exploited without having the proper permission from a person who owns the rights or, or the license to those rights. Um, examples, common examples of infringement include uh, counterfeiting uh, and piracy. Does anybody know what I mean by piracy? Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't involve like, you know, a eye patch, a parrot, and a uh, sword and a boat. Um, piracy in this context means uh, ripping off a motion picture. Um, so if you take a picture that has been released by Hollywood and you uh, exploit it for commercial purposes, uh, uh, that's uh, piracy. Um, and of course counterfeiting, everybody knows what counterfeiting is. It actually is a form of, uh, of intellectual property uh, infringement. Uh, so the types of infringement, copyright infringement, patent infringement, and trademark infringement, pretty straightforward. Um, and within those categories of infringements, there are different types of infringement. There's direct infringement, indirect infringement, induced infringement, and contributory infringement. And I just want to touch on the differences between the two. Direct infringement is pretty much straightforward. It's the actual making in a first-hand sense, uh, using, offering to sell, selling, or importing uh, to the U.S. or any country where there is intellectual property right protection, an infringing product during the life of the patent uh, without the license from the patent holder. That's a pretty straightforward uh, form of infringement. So if you steal somebody's uh, intellectual property, uh, that's a form of direct infringement. But indirect infringement takes two forms. There's contributory infringement or inducement to infringe on a patent. So patent law states that whoever actively induces the infringement of a patent shall be li as liable as the infringer. 
In other words, a company does not have to infringe on a patent directly in order to be sued for patent infringement. Um, can you think of an example of uh, something that might constitute uh, an indirect patent infringement? So let's say I, as inventor A, own the patent on a, on a device, a mousetrap. Uh, and um, the mousetrap is patented in the United States and China. I want to market the, my mousetrap in China because there are more mice in China to catch than there are in the United States. I'm going to make more money there. Um, and um, somebody in China uh, imports my device and without my uh, permission distributes it through a third party, a third uh, like Walmart or Amazon or um, any company that distributes. The distributing company can also be liable for infringement. So there's the licensee or the patent holder um, who owns the patent, but anyone who then uses a third party to distribute that illegally, that is without a license, without permission from the patent holder, um, is uh, infringing indirectly. Okay, and so and they can be as liable. As, the, uh, as a direct infringer. And that's why when you sell through Amazon or when you sell through Walmart, one of the things that the, distrib the distributing uh, uh, a party wants to know is whether or not you have um, a, um, a right to sell or uh, uh, use that invention. So they'll, they all have contracts where you have to assure them that uh, you are the, the rights holder, that you are operating under a valid license or you are the inventor. Uh, and that's because they don't want to be held liable for indirect infringement. Uh, induced infringement uh, is a form of indirect infringement, and it's that which enables the direct infringer to practice the patented invention. Um, people, examples of, uh, of uh, people that have been sued or parties that have been sued for induced infringement um, is, uh, are companies that uh, uh, publicize or offer for sale uh, either electronically through social media or um, uh, electronic marketing uh, or through printed um, uh, brochures, newspaper advertisements, um, things like that. Uh, so that's um, uh, another form of indirect infringement. And it can take the form of helping the direct infringer to assemble a patented product, providing instructions that detail how to produce the patented invention, preparing uh, instructions for consumer use or licensing patents, or a process which enables the licensee to produce the patent or patented uh, product and process. Um, the test for induced, induced infringement is whether the inducer has demonstrated uh, an active aiding and abetting of the direct infringer's infringing acts. So for instance, if, um, and this actually happened, there's a company that owns uh, a patent on some uh, uh, medicines uh, in Argentina called uh, uh, Aries Serono. Uh, somebody got the idea to uh, take some of their medicines and sell them in the United States. Uh, in order to do that, they had to hire a company to create brochures and packaging for the, uh, for, for the medicines that they were importing illegally. So not only was the party that brought these medicines into the United States that were owned by Eri Serono in Argentina, uh, the direct infringer, the company that they hired to um, package and create um, labeling and uh, inserts for the medicines uh, were, um, uh, were also guilty of infringement um, because they aided and abetted the uh, direct infringement of the uh, patented medicine. Um, agency and you get hired to, you know, to do this kind of work. Right. Uh, and you still uh, are liable for The question is, if you're an advertising agency, can you be held liable as an indirect infringer? And the answer is, it depends. Um, generally not, okay, because an advertising agency is a little bit too far down the line. But, it, but in circumstances where the advertising agency is working directly with the patent infringer or the copyright infringer, um, it's potentially um, uh, uh, 
in a situation where they could be held liable. Um, it depends upon whether they have knowledge um, or perhaps they've been misled. So uh, the difference is in, in the state of the knowledge that they have. Um, generally speaking, the courts will look at the, uh, the advertising agency or, um, for instance, uh, uh, Craigslist or uh, any of the companies that sell things online kind of as a third party. They'll look and see whether or not um, the, the, the promoter of this uh, has any knowledge or should have any knowledge. You know, one thing, you can't, you can't sort of um, uh, stick your head in the sand and pretend that you don't know, especially if, if it's something obvious. Uh, let's, uh, let's say you're, you're, you're selling something which is obviously stolen. You know, maybe it's in the news, all right? Maybe they're, they're doing knockoffs of, of, a, of a Louis Vuitton bag, okay? And you're knowingly promoting this. So in that sort of situation, an advertiser or somebody that's involved in the distribution um, uh, can't stick their head in the sand and, and, and claim, na uh, claim ignorance. So it really depends uh, on how remote you are to the um, infringement uh, in the first instance. If you knew or should have known, you probably will be held liable. Uh, if you're so remote, if you're the Boston Globe uh, or, the, um, or the New York Times and you're just uh, just uh, uh, publicizing an advert for it, uh, not likely. Uh, although it, it, it has happened. In, on the criminal side, you know, it, it actually has happened that uh, the various U.S. attorneys' office have actually not only um, uh, uh, criminally prosecuted the infringer, but they've actually tried to follow the chain all the way down the line to the, to the, um, to the media that publicizes it. And the reason for it is because uh, they've argued that they've aided and abetted in some knowing way uh, or some knowing fashion uh, a, a crime. Uh, so it depends on what you know, okay? It, it's prudent, you know, if you're being asked to distrib distribute these things um, to have the, the customer certify or assure you in some way that they uh, have a right to do this. Um, all right, so let's talk about the, a couple of types of different forms of infringement. Patent infringement is the commission of a prohibited act with respect to a patented invention without permission. Uh, and permission is usually granted, at how? In the form of a license. And there are various licensing agreements. Uh, they're they're, they're uh, from the very simple to very complex. Anybody that has ever downloaded uh, an iTunes um, you know, the, um, the agreement that comes with that uh, doesn't happen to have, to have anything to do with patent infringement, but it, it's with, with respect to copyright. I mean, these agreements can be very complex. Um, uh, if you don't have a license, if you're not the owner of the patent, uh, a commercial exploitation of that device is most likely patent infringement. Um, and and uh, patent infringements uh, actually do vary from jurisdiction to ju jurisdiction but it usually requires the commercial exploitation. Um, if you're not commercially ex exploiting the device, you're probably, at least that's one defense to a patent infringement action. So, uh, and, and, and the idea of infringement is to prevent people from uh, essentially benefiting or profiting from someone else's protected intellectual property rights. And so one of the typical defenses in a patent infringement action is that you've derived no profit. You've, you've not attempted to, commer to commercially exploit it. So if there's no commercial exploitation, there's probably no patent infringement. Uh, in some countries, it's an absolute requirement. Um, and to determine whether or not there's been an infringement of a patent, um, you, um, uh, you go to the claims. So whether or not infringement has occurred depends upon whether or not the use that you're putting, to which you're putting the invention is covered by any of the claims. If the terms of the claims inform the, the public of what is not allowed with, permit, with respect to permission to use the environment, so uh, the, the, uh, the um, invention. So, if, so we talked about how you look at a house. If you buy a house, you own everything within those four walls, the roof and the, and the basement. And that's the same thing with a patent. 
you own everything within the four corners of the document that contains the claims. If it falls outside of those claims, you probably don't own it. If you're, if you're making use of an invention for something other than that which it is claimed to do, you probably don't have an infringement. If, however, you're, you're accused of infringement, the court will look to the claims and see whether or not the use to which you're putting the invention uh, and deriving commercial profit from it is contained within the claim section. And your defense, as someone who's accused of, a, of, a, of an infringement, will be that these, these claims um, uh, uh, are limited and the use to which I'm putting this is not covered by the claims. Um, that's like the, the, the litigation we've talked about with the Broad Institute and, 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 and the University of California. Yeah? Is there like a fair use type law for patents? Is there a fair use for patents? Um, Yes, if I came up here in front of this class and demonstrated the super mousetrap invention that I've been talking about since the beginning of class, I guess that would be considered a fair use. Another way of talking about it, though, would be that it's for educational purposes uh, and not commercial uh, exploitation of the patent. Fair use is usually something that is covered is a defense to copyright infringement claims. But you know, there are, you know, there are similarities between um, uh, non-commercial use of a patent and fair use. I guess you could say almost any non-commercial use of a patent would be considered the equivalent, at least, of fair use. So if it's not being commercially exploited, you're probably not infringing. Um, but you may be violating other things. You may be violating, you know, other intellectual property rights. All right. Um, patents are territorial, and so, of course, infringement is only possible within the territory, uh, territorial limits of the place where the device is patented. If you don't, if your invention is not protected in the other countries, um, then you're not entitled to... Um, protection there. You can't file a claim for infringement. So if you invent a mousetrap uh, and patent it here in the United States, um, if you do not file a patent application in France, you can't go and enforce the, the patent in France. Um, if within one year of your patenting the invention in the United States, you find somebody using your patent in France, then you can run to France and file your patent application because you have one year, remember you have one year within which to file uh, under the what? What 1883 uh, treaty? Begins with a P. The Paris Convention, that moldy old document that 99% of the world is uh, signatory to, which gives you intellectual property rights in all the countries, almost all the countries in the world, that requires France to recognize your patent rights here in the United States in France, just like it was filed in France. So if you find out about that and you, you get on an airplane and you go to France and you file your patent application, then you can seek uh, damages for infringement in France. And that happens quite actually quite often. And next week we'll go through some examples, actually some pretty funny examples of how that, how that has played out in real life. So if, if, for example, a patent is granted in the United States and anyone in the United States is prohibited from making, using, selling, or importing the patent, patented item, while people in other countries may be free to exploit it. So the scope of the, of the, of the protection varies from country to country, and it doesn't, uh, uh, it doesn't exist if you don't file the application in a country uh, where, um, that recognizes your, your, your rights. Now, there's something here called the doctrine of equivalence that you need to know about because it's, it's kind of um, uh, a, um, uh, a, an important rule when it comes to uh, infringement. Uh, and it's a way that the, the concept of infringement has, has been expanded. The doctrine of equivalence is a legal rule in most jurisdictions that allows a court to hold that a party is liable for infringement even though the infringing device or process does not read on the technology or fall within the literal scope of the patent claim, but nevertheless is equivalent to the patent claim. Now, what does that mean? 
What that means, the doctrine of equivalence means that even if your device is not exactly the same, but it does exactly the same thing, then under the doctrine, doctrine of equivalence, equivalence, T-S, under the doctrine of equivalence, you can be held liable for patent infringement. All right? Um, and that's because how do we find out? How do you determine whether or not the doctrine of uh, equivalence applies? If, if, you have, if you have two devices, both of them, they're not, a, not identical, but how do we find out if the doctrine of equivalence um, applies? What do you look to? What's, what's, what's the thing that you file with a patent application where every word is important? Claims, exactly. You look to the claims. If this device, which is non-identical to this patented device, does exactly the same thing that the patented device claims claim, then there's probably um, uh, an infringement. If you're um, the Broad Institute and you come up with a new methodology uh, for gene manipulation that does exactly the same thing as uh, a method patented by another university, you're probably infringing. And the whole contest will be to show how your methodology is different and how it does different things. If you can show that your methodology is different, uh, or if your methodology is the same, but it does different things, then you can defeat the infringement claim. But, the, uh, but in cases where two inventions uh, are not identical, but they do exactly the same thing, um, under the doctrine of, of equivalence, um, you could be held liable for, um, uh, uh, for infringement. And, and this test varies from country to country, but in general it requires that the infringing party, party's product or method, service, or process falls within one or more of the claims of the patent. The process uh, employed involves reading a claim onto the technology of interest. So if you're, if you're trying to find out whether the doctrine of, of equivalence uh, pertains, you need to go to the claim section of the patent. And if it does exactly the same thing, you may have a case of an infringement. So if the claims, claim elements are found in the technology, the claim is said to read on the technology. That's, uh, that's just patent lawyer talk for uh, being the same as the technology. If a single element from the claim is missing from the technology, the claim does not literally read on. Uh, so the technology probably does not infringe. It has to be identical. Uh, again, remember, the difference between uh, something that can be patented or protected and something that can't be is whether or not there's an advance in the art. And that's a perfect defense to uh, an infringement action based upon the doctrine of equivalence. You, if you can say, well, you know, it does do that, but it does more, uh, you'll probably defeat the infringement action. But a word about the, the doctrine of equivalence is, uh, is probably um, worthwhile. Um, there was a case, a uh, famous case called Warner versus Jenkins, uh, and, and it, it's a case where the Supreme Court talked about the doctrine of equi equivalence when it comes to um, uh, claims. And basically what it says is that the test should be whether the difference between the feature in the accused device and the, and the limitation literally recited in the patent claim is insubstantial. So where they're almost identical or the differences are insubstantial, the doctrine of equivalence probably uh, 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 obtains. And um, in order to, to test whether or not it's in, insubstantial, you look at the feature of the device and ask yourself three questions. Does it perform the substantially the same function? Uh, does it perform that function in substantially the same way? Uh, and does, does it yield the substantially uh, same result? If the answer to any of those questions is no, then you probably don't have an infringement uh, and the doctrine of equivalence doesn't apply. There's a famous case actually called Brilliant Instruments where the Federal Circuit, um, uh, actually saw this case argued in front of me in the Federal Circuit way back in 2013. I was sitting there watching the lawyers from these companies 
uh, argue this case. It's, you know, by the way, the amount of technical knowledge that advocates have that get hired to do these things is truly amazing. Um, you'd never know the difference between the lawyers and the PhDs in biochemistry or technology that actually design the thing. Um, I'm always, I always sit in amazement when I look at, uh, I see some of these arguments. And I sat through this brilliant instruments uh, case while I was waiting to argue my case in the Federal Circuit. And it involved a, um, uh, uh, a circuit which was uh, commonly used by this guide tech company uh, to detect um, or measure timing errors in microprocessors. Uh, and while the design in this case was different, it functioned in the same way. And the Federal Circuit ruled that uh, this constituted infringement. In fact, you could sit there and listen to the arguments and you could hear and you could see which way the Federal Circuit panel was, was uh, going to decide the case. The three judges sitting there, you could tell from their questions. What they basically asked the lawyers who were, who were um, uh, arguing the case on behalf of the person that was accused of infringement was, uh, these questions literally came from the judge. Counsel, tell me why uh, it doesn't, doesn't perform substantially the same function. Counsel, tell me why it doesn't uh, perform it substantially the same way. Tell me why it doesn't uh, yield substantially the same result. That's literally the test that they applied and I watched. The, and that's literally what happens at these, he, at these, uh, at these uh, hearings in front of the courts um, as the judges struggle to determine whether or not to apply these tests. And uh, the answer uh, from the um, uh, from the brilliant uh, excuse me from the from the uh, brilliant instruments people were uh, not satisfactory to the court in that case. Um, so defenses, common defenses to patent infringement actions. Uh, first, the infringer was not practicing the patent invention. Do we all know what pat practicing means? It basically means using the device. Practicing a patent means. Um, using a device that does substantially the same thing or, or the identical thing. That just mean, that's just called practicing the patent. So um, the claims define the extent of the protection conferred by a patent. We know that. So uh, the, another defense is the infringing act was not performed within the territory covered by the patent. Um, that's pretty self-explanatory, something that uh, uh, sh should uh, be familiar to you now. Uh, the term of the patent has expired. How long do patents uh, last? Begin 20 years. 20 years, exactly. So has it been 20 years since the patent uh, was, uh, was filed? Uh, is the patent invalid? Because the invention in question does not meet um, the, um, uh, the patentability requirements. Now this is the main defense that you always encounter in patent uh, infringement actions. Um, the defense usually will be, I'm not infringing on this, uh, on this patent because the, the, there's something invalid about the patent that was granted by the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Um, uh, they, shouldn't have, they, sh they shouldn't, for instance, have patented this device because the inventor was not able to prove that claim. I've been able to demonstrate that my device can perform this function. Um, they, weren't able to, they weren't able to prove that their device could, um, could um, uh, perform that function. Uh, therefore, it did not satisfy the what requirement? Begins with an N, ends with a Y. Novelty, exactly, exactly. All these pastries are not, are not wasted. Right, it doesn't satisfy the novelty requirement. Um, you don't own that patent because you weren't able to show that your process could produce those results. Your scientists gave, gave uh, interviews to the press saying, well, we couldn't figure out how to make it do that. I've figured out how to do that. Therefore, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office should not have granted a patent with respect to that particular claim. Therefore, I'm not infringing. You're the wrong party. So that's the way those, that's 90% of patent cases uh, has to do with uh, there's something invalid about the patent that the infringer is accused of infringing. You also often see counterclaims in these cases to um, invalidate or cancel uh, a patent. Uh, that's, that's 
that's where most of the um, uh, most of the um, uh, defenses to patent infringement actions fall under. And also, you know, of course, well, I have a license. I have permission. They told me I could use it. Um, or they looked the other way when they, when they learned that I was using it. That's another form of, um, of a defense to a patent action. Um, because we've covered it already, I thought it was important, and because some of the fun examples I have at the end of the lecture have to do with this, I thought I'd cover it. Uh, copyright infringement is the use of works protected by copyright law without permission, infringing certain exclusive rights granted the copyright holder. Because we've talked about copyright. What are the types of things covered by copyright? Books, perfect. Movies, performances, something that Core 6 students at MIT spend a lot of time with. Code, exactly. That's really important. Copyright is, uh, is uh, uh, you know, um, uh, probably the most fertile area. Can you think of another thing um, as students you should be concerned about when, um, in, with, with respect to copyright infringement? You all write papers, right? And when you write papers, you read other people's papers, right? And if you use other people's writing, what is that? It's copyright infringement. And it's a violation of the code of ethics that you have here as uh, students at MIT. Yeah? So I'm wondering, it mentions in the last point, or to make derivative works, how does um, fair use, like, like where is something fair use and like you're doing something for like a parody versus making a derivative work, I guess? Well, gee, I guess uh, either you read my uh, slide presentation um, uh, before you came here or you're uh, prescient because can I hold that question for the next couple of uh, slides because that's what I want to get into. And that's where a lot of the fun actually uh, uh, is in copyright infringement. But uh, getting back to the original point, uh, because, it, because it's derivative of the point that you're making, um, you know, use of, of, uh, of copyrighted material uh, for uh, certain reasons is okay. For educated, educational purposes, it doesn't mean you, it, it kind of means me. Um, I, I'm not commercially exploiting. I am. I'm hopefully educating here. So one of the th one of the things you can do is you can use uh, copyrighted materials, at least portions of copyrighted materials, for educational reasons. But you can also use it uh, for reasons, other reasons that come within the fail, uh, fair use umbrella, like parody and commentary, uh, criticism. So all of that all that comes under fair use. Um, and most of these things are, um, are uh, resolved in, in civil cases. Um, they have a substantial uh, you know, similarity test. So if you've written a, a book and somebody else writes a, a book uh, and they have literally copied sections of your book, you bring a lawsuit in, in state or federal court to stop the publication of the infringing work. And the way, they, the way they literally determine whether or not there's been an infringement is they take uh, a page from uh, the infringing work and they put it up against a, a page of the copyrighted work. And if they're the same, there's an infringement. Or if a reasonable person would conclude that they're substantially the same. So again, you can't, you can't just change a few words here and there and protect yourself from uh, a claim of infringement or claim of academic um, fraud, um, you, have to, you have to substantially change it. You have to add to it. You have to improve on it. There has to be, you have to create distance between the, the copyrighted work and the work that you're, uh, that you're, uh, that you're claiming authorship of. Uh, so you know, changing some things around the edges doesn't, um, doesn't do anything. And, uh, and when we try these cases in court, we have a slide just like this and we put the the copyrighted uh, work on one side, and we put the um, infringing work on the other side so that the jury can look at it. And they are later instructed by the judge that they don't have to be identical, but if they're substantially similar, if a reasonable person would conclude that they're substantially the same, they're infringing. 
So that means, you know, they don't have to be identical, and, and just changing a few things around the edges does not qualify as, um, uh, as a defense. Um, so um, shifting public expectations, advances in digital technology, increasing uh, the increasing reach of social media and the internet have led to widespread anonymous infringement. I mean, you used to have to actually make an effort to infringe on, on things now, but um, has anybody ever taken a screenshot on something that uh, Shutterstock, uh, you know, uh, has? I mean, has anyone wanted to send like a, a, uh, a funny meme to a friend who, who has a birthday or some, some, something happening in their life? We all talk by memes now, and you go on the internet and you go to Shutterstock, and you know, Shutterstock has that little thing on the bottom saying this, this is copyrighted and you take a uh, screenshot of it, and then you put it in your photo editor, and you, and you, um, you change the boundaries to eliminate that little Shutterstock uh, uh, warning at the, uh, on the bottom, and you send it off to your friend, and everybody has a good, law, good, good laugh. Um, if you commercially exploit that, that's copyright infringement. And it's so easy nowadays to copy and paste, to take screenshots, to download. In the old days, you used to have to really work hard <laughs> to infringe on a copyright. But nowadays, it is so easy. But there's no difference. In order to, be, be, to commit copyright infringement, all you have to do is what? Copy. And it's so easy to copy now that, um, that uh, the instances of copyright infringement are uh, ubiquitous. I mean, it's just technology has made this so easy. And the way we share things on social media, the way we share these things on different platforms, makes the instances of copyright infringement um, so, um, uh, so much more numerous and, and really brings into play fair use. Um, that is something that's very important now. Um, when you're, you know, you're sharing, you're sharing um, uh, iTunes with a friend, you download uh, iTunes, you pay five cents for your song, you share it with a friend. Is that copyright infringement? You bet your life it is. Yeah, it is. And it's so easy to do, but just because it's easy to do doesn't make it uh, permissible. Anyhow, uh, defenses to copyright actions. Uh, invalidity of the copyright, you know, uh, how long a copyright's uh, valid? How many years plus the life of the author or authors? Exactly. Wonderful. Um, so uh, the author is dead uh, and buried, and it's been uh, 70 years. Um, you know, uh, so the, um, the, copyright is, uh, the co copyright is expired. Um, statute of limitations, uh, you have a certain amount of time within which to bring a copyright uh, infringement action. Public domain, which is what we've, we've begun to talk about. The defendant may argue that the work is in the public domain. Fair use, the defendant may argue that there is a valid and legal use of the copyrighted material that does not infringe on the user's rights, uh, the owner's rights. That's probably the biggest uh, uh, sink into which uh, uh, of defenses for um, uh, copyright. Uh, and mistake, the defendant may argue that the infringement was by an accident uh, or unknowing or innocent. Um, but uh, that usually doesn't fly in commercial cases. All right, so let's talk about fair use um, because it's been brought up. Fair use is any copying of copyrighted material done for a limited and transformative purpose, such as to comment upon, criticize, or parody a copyrighted work. Such uses can be done without permission from the copyright owner. If your use qualifies as fair use, then it would not be considered an infringement. So what is a transformative use? Um, this is a vague definition, and it's intentionally vague. Like everything in the law, it depends, OK? And the de definition of a transformative use um, is, um, is vague because the use to which um, copyrighted materials can be put um, is constantly changing. As the media changes, as our rules of society change, um, the uses to which copyrighted materials may be put changes. And so that's why we use, as lawyers, we use vague terms like transformative use. 
Uh, it's simply a way of, of, um, of making sure that we protect the owners of intellectual property rights uh, as technology changes. So there are no hard and fast rules, only general guidelines and various court decisions because courts and lawmakers who created the fair use exception uh, don't want to limit its definition. Like free speech, they want to leave an, ex, uh, an expansive meaning uh, that could be open to interpretation, both uh, to protect public uh, or um, social criticism or entertainment, and both to protect the rights of the copyright owner. So uh, if you are co commenting upon or critiquing a copyrighted work, for instance, writing a book review, fair use principles apply. Uh, you, so you are able to reproduce some of this in order to, to, uh, to critique it or report on it. Can anybody think of some other examples before I go over them um, of, of fair use? So this is one example. I'm a book critic. I work for the New York Times. I'm commenting on or uh, writing a report uh, for the New York Times book review section uh, about, a, uh, about a book that's just been published. Um, maybe that uh, contains some political criticism, and I quote sections of the book in my New York Times article. Uh, is that copyright infringement? No, I say, of course not, because I'm reporting. Uh, my, I'm performing a, a social function. I am commercially exploiting it because the New York Ch Times charges, you know, three dollars and fifty cents for their newspaper every Sunday. All right, so there's commercial exploitation. But this falls within the category of fair use because we don't want to inhibit our ability as a society to comment on things that other people do, all right? So writing a book report is one example of, of fair use. Can anybody think of, in their common experiences, uh, some examples of fair use? Anything? Do you watch Saturday Night Live at all? All right. Who watches Saturday Night? Who has ever watched Saturday Night Live? All right, a few hands. Have you ever seen the parodies that they do on Saturday Night Live, right? Um, so that's an example of fair use. Um, what if I were to um, uh, create a blog post for, um, uh, uh, for a subject that I really love, ballet? And I watch, and, I, and I, I, let's say I've gone to see the new Forsyth Ballet that the Boston uh, Ballet is performing. And I sit down and I, and I, uh, I take... Um, uh, portions of the ballet, and I, and I, I put, I put pictures of it up, and I say, you know, this William Forsyth has absolutely no idea what he's doing. He has no business being a ballet choreographer. I fell asleep three times during the performance, and here's an example of his work. Is that copyright infringement? Oh. Your instinct uh, causing you to shake your heads in the negative. Of course not. I'm critiquing. I'm, I'm, or I might be making fun. Uh, of, uh, of a work. And those are perfect examples of, um, of fair use. So if I'm, if I'm critiquing it, making a criticism of it, uh, saying, and, and the criticism doesn't have to be sophisticated. You know, I'm just a caveman. I don't know anything about choreography. But I have an opinion. And if I want to stand up on a soapbox in, uh, in the middle of Boston Common, or if I want to create a blog post that criticizes William Forsyth's work, if I say that he should never have been hired uh, by Boston Ballet from uh, the Paris ba Ballet, it's a waste of money because his choreography is absolutely absurd, obscure, and has no place in a ballet, I can say that. And I can use examples of, the, of his work. That's a criticism. That's a critique. It falls within the public domain. If I decide to make, you, make, make fun of him, if I create a parody, if I dress up in a funny costume and I perform the ballet myself in order to critique the awkwardness of his choreography, is, is that a, a, a I'm, even though I'm copying it, is, is, is that a uh, infringement? No, because I'm, I'm, I'm creating a parody, I'm making fun. This is a social criticism. This is my way of talking about the value of this work. Um, have you ever seen, uh, who, um, you know, who, who reads The Lampoon or Mad Magazine? Have you ever read Mad, oh, God, I'm really dating myself now. Have you ever heard of Mad Magazine? <laughs> okay, thank you. They, even if you haven't, thank you for saying yes. But, but, but you know, Alfred E. Newman used to, used to have, uh, used to be on the cover. 
But then they would change his visage. You know, he'd, he'd look like a president or he'd look like a, a public figure. Um, you know, they'd just kind of change the way he'd look. Um, but uh, what about the person that owns the rights to their public, uh, their, their public um, uh, uh, appearance? Well, uh, if you're a public uh, uh, person, then people have a right to comment on you. Um, I mean, I remember one, this, of course, was before you were born, but, you know, Alfred, he, Richard Nixon had a very uh, well-known nose, I guess. Um, and, you know, they put Alfred E. Newman on the cover with Richard Nixon's nose, and, you know, everybody knew it was Richard Nixon's nose, but Richard Nixon couldn't sue uh, Mad Magazine uh, because they were, they were creating um, a, a, a parody, a, a criticism, a caricature of him. Uh, and that's fair commentary. It's called fair use, okay? Um, uh, show some of my, uh, my biases here. Some examples of commentary and criticism. Quoting a few lines from a Bob Dylan song in a music review. Not copyright infringement. You're allowed to do that because I'm, I'm, I'm commenting it, uh, about it. I'm, I'm reviewing it. Summarizing and quoting uh, from a medical article on cancer uh, in a news report. Where would the news be if you couldn't copy? Has anybody yet? Well, Bre yes, Brian. So I have a question. With some pharmaceutical companies, they choose not to release the, their proprietary ingredients. If another pharmaceutical company comes out with the same exact drug, can they retroactively claim infringement? If, or is that independent of them? That's really interesting. I think that the defense of perhaps the defense of accident or um, unintended infringement would apply in that case. Uh, if you're talking about you know pharmaceutical pharma, pharmaceutical company A and um, MIT PhD without a job working in their garage B, both come up with the same compound. Um, and um, the pharmaceutical company A never publishes their, their active ingredients or their key constituent agreement, agreement, ingredients. And if I'm representing my unemployed MIT PhD working in their garage trying to come up with a um, compound inventor, my defense would be unintentional um, uh, use and no infringement. I would say that that's an independent, you know, just now. Um, I may be prohibited from distributing uh, if uh, the company can show that they have a valid patent on it and that they're identical, um, but I won't be liable for damages. Yes? So would you then like, publish the paper saying what the compound is and the pharmaceutical company wanted to keep it a secret and it's like public information? Mm -hmm. What happens? You mean uh, I have independently discovered the the yeah, the recipe? The well, what what will probably happen is the company will try to sue to stop me from publication, and you'll come to my office, you'll hire me, and uh, we'll have a fight because uh, what I'll say is that this my client independently came up with this invention. Uh, and it's too bad that they figured out uh, the key ingredients to Coca-Cola. Um, but um, uh, there's no infringement here because there's no copying. They came up with it independently. So the key to a copyright infringement is copying. If you didn't copy, uh, but again, you know, you're going to have to you know, you're going to have to get on the stand, and you have to produce your notebooks, and you have to show your research in, in order for me to convince that jury that you truly did come up with this on your own. And, you know, the, the, in discovery, the, the, you know, the Coca-Cola company or the pharmaceutical company will probably ask the court to order you to turn over your, the hard drive of your computer so that they can go through your Google search history and determine whether or not you were ever on there, you know, Googling the pharmaceutical company or Googling the Coca-Cola company. So, you know, um, it's going to be a fight, all right? But if you did not copy, then you are not infringing, whether it happens to be, you know, a paper about uh, a, a drug or the distribution of an actual drug that you've developed yourself. 
If you're not copying, you're not infringing, okay? Um, so summarizing and quoting from a medical article, I mean, can you imagine what would happen on the news if um, every time there was an invention that came out, did you, did you read recently that, the, um, that, that a, a, a using a, um, a genetic therapy, they, they have um, the second patient ever uh, has been found to have um, uh, been, um, uh, the, the HIV virus has been, has been eliminated in them, um, which seems to suggest that there's a way for uh, curing the AIDS virus. Well, you publish a, a, a portion of that uh, paper, uh, when and if it is written, uh, on the news. Is that copyright infringement? You're copying, but you're, but you're informing the public. You're performing a, a, a vital function. That's not, so that's not infringement. Um, copying a few paragraphs from a news article for use uh, by a teacher or a student in a lesson. So uh, educational purposes, that, that, that includes fair use. No commercial exploitation, even though you're copying, as long as there's no commercial exploitation, you're probably not infringing. Yes? Say there's like um, a for-profit university and the teacher uses copyrighted works like that. Um, would that be considered popular? Because yeah. kind of commercial. Yeah, you know, I, when I was writing this slide, I, that, that, that uh, actually occurred to me. Um, and the, I can only tell you what the court cases say. Um, if it's used for um, educational purposes, uh, that's a complete defense. Um, the fact that the university, not the teacher, um, the fact that the university that, that employs the um, a teacher somehow gets indirectly uh, a profit from, you know, uh, charging students exorbitant tu tuitions uh, is not direct enough to constitute uh, a, a way of vitiating the, the, um, the um, commercial exploitation, commercial uh, uh, educational purposes uh, defense. Uh, but, you know, I think about that because, you know, I'm, you know if I'm standing up here and I'm, I'm basically selling a product, I guess, right? It's another way of looking at it. You know, universities compete. Um, they try to bring students in. Uh, so, you know, um, it's something that has occurred to me, but uh, as long as it's done for um, commercial purposes and there's no direct link to the use of the copyrighted material and a profit, uh, then there's no, um, there's no infringement. Um, but, you know, Again, transformative, you know, we keep these definitions loose. So well, how about, you know, how about, how, about, how about if you and I start a university you know, or we call it a university, you know? Um, now, now the lines get a little bit more blurred because um, is it really a university? Are these really commercial purposes? You know, what if, what if, you, what if you're um, uh, conducting a seminar, all right? And you're, 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 you're advertising, you know, um, your expertise in a particular area. So there's a direct relationship between, you know, what you're uh, doing and, and, and profit. Um, and you, you know, you can, you can broadly say that what you're doing here at, um, uh, at Trump University is educating people on, on, you know, your methods of real estate manipulation. But if you put somebody's uh, stuff up on the board, I think that the, the line is, not, uh, uh, is, is, is a little bit more blurred in that particular case. I think that's an infringement. But um, so there's, oftentimes it's defined by you know, the distance between the copyright, uh, the copying, and the profit. Um, trust me, the distance between me standing here and the profit made by this institution is light years. <laughs> so, and much different than if I'm conducting a seminar at the Marriott Hotel in Newton on how I know more about how I know how to make profit in real estate or you know, um, venture capital or stocks or something like that. So um, it de again, the answer is it depends. Um, copying a portion of a book or magazine article for, for, uh, for use in a court case. We end up doing this all the time, actually. Um, you know, I have, a, I have an expert witness on the stand and there's an important passage from a book that they wrote. It'll go up on the board like this. That's not copyright infringement, even though I'm copying. 
it's a fair use of, of, a, um, of a protected um, uh, work. And my favorite area is, of course, parody, because I love, uh, obviously, Mad Magazine and Saturday Night Live and, you know, every kind of, um, uh, every kind of uh, art form that makes fun of, um, of, of uh, things. So a parody is a work that includes, uh, that ridicules others, usually well-known work by imitating in a comic way. Um, you know, um, anybody uh, see the Book of Mormon? All right. Well, that's based on the Book of Mormon, which is copyrighted, and which the Church of Latter-day Saints uh, very um, vigorously enforces the, the um, copyright on that. So why didn't, uh, what are the name of those guys uh, that came up with South Park? They're the guys that, that promoted the thing. Um, you know, um, why, weren't they, um, why weren't they sued successfully? Well, because it's, uh, it's a parody. Um, anyhow, I wanted to just go through, here's a famous uh, infringement case. Uh, Adidas goes through all kinds of, uh, uh, spends all kinds of money protecting their three stripes. Here's a suit that they filed against Puma, who had four stripes. Uh, here's a suit uh, that they brought against uh, uh, Tesla for um, putting three stripes next to the model. Believe it or not, Tesla, Tesla quit. They, they, they backed off. Even though they're making cars and Adidas is making shoes, Tesla walked away from it. They dropped the three stripes. Um, this is the case I wanted to. I'll end with this, and we'll talk about it when we start next time. The question for next time is, is this infringement? Do you know, anybody know what this is? Uh, represents $3.1 billion in sales every year. Um, what, do you know what it is? Yeah, it's called J it, it, Jordans. It's very interesting. It, actually, it's called Jumpman. Um, but this is the Nike Jumpman. And, and what, is it, what is it used to, what product is it used to, you know, to, uh, to market? Uh, Air Jordans. So the question is for next time, I want you to think about this. Um, forget all your other work. Don't do anything. Just think about this. Is this patent infr uh, copyright infringement? And I will have the answer for you next time. No Googling it. Besides, you have to know the name of the case to, to find out. So going back to your uh, last sample about the three stripes, so those three stripes cannot be used in any... Man, you know, if you ask Adidas, yeah. And this is one of the things that companies do when it comes to protecting their trademarks or their copyrighted materials. They become super aggressive. And if you don't have enough money uh, to fight them, usually they end up, they end up bullying you. Um, in my opinion, if I was Tesla, I would have kept using the three stripes because I'm making cars, not shoes. Right. Who's going to confuse the two? Yeah, you know, it's it's like, hey, who has the who has the money sometimes? But I want to know, I want to know whether this is copyright infringement next time I see you, okay. or trademark infringement.